Hello everyone and welcome back to another podcast with Sploosh. Uh, it has been a really, really long time since we've actually had a, an actual discussion. And so if you're tuning in right now, uh, thank you so much for listening. So I'm Joven and with me here is Hao Yang in a new episode of Anaphora, uh, which we've decided to title because I thought it sounded cool and because we're feeling especially jolly today and because of the date, we will be talking about Christmas. For me, my experiences with Christmas aren't really like um, super in line with what you would normally see on the media. Uh, maybe it's because my family isn't exactly like Christian, so we don't really like celebrate Christmas as an occasion or as a sort of occasion for like for our extended family to get together and that kind of thing. So for me, I think Christmas has always been marked by the commercial element of it. So for example, like seeing the, the ads that come up on uh, billboards, or on online shopping sites, or on uh, television commercials. I think that's how Christmas has been defined for me for the past few years. And yeah, it's just quite strange that for a holiday, it's something that's sort of been <clears throat> imposed on me rather than something that I feel like, oh, uh, I wake up and I just feel the Christmas mood, right? But it's more of like, I see the date is 25th December and I think, oh, okay, it's Christmas Day. So it's not really something that's that really feels like a holiday to me. And what about you, Haoyang? Well, yeah, my family doesn't celebrate Christmas either, but I still appreciate it as a time of, I think, festive cheer. And generally, I think the general mood is just much better, more nicer and friendlier. So I like that. Um, I haven't really felt that kind of estrangement or alienation that you talked about, but which I think is something I'm quite interested in to learn more about. I think for me, another, I guess, festive date that makes more sense to me and which I relate more to it would be the winter solstice which this year coincides I think around Christmas so yesterday was the winter solstice and so for the Chinese um, usually you like make tang yuan which is like glutinous rice balls and yeah I really like that because it really brought the family together to just like roll those rice balls and eat them afterwards yeah I think you know in Chinese culture um, roundness is very significant right whether it's like during mid-autumn, you appreciate the round moon and to bring the family together, you have a, round, a perfect family, I guess, in harmony. And then again, in winter solstice, you have that kind of um, communion as well. So yeah, that's what I really like. And I guess that's really the spirit behind um, festive dates like Christmas as well. Besides, I guess, other symbolic um, things like uh, charity, gift giving, etc. Yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, I think now that you mentioned it, right, uh, one thing that I didn't really consider just now was the idea of gift giving. I think quite recently I've been involved in a lot of secret centers and it's a really good opportunity to just like get together with friends and, and celebrate each other, right? I, I feel that gift giving is, it can be really meaningful if you treat it as a measure of love for somebody else. I mean, these past few years have been pretty tough for some people. Maybe some people may not have socialized as much with other people in recent years. And yeah, it's a great occasion to just get together and, and just show our love for each other. And yeah, thank you for, for mentioning that, Hao Yang. Actually, I'm not really fond of gift giving, but because I never... Oh, why, why? I think I'm just a frugal person, to put it nicely. But I think when I get gifts, I feel the pressure to give gifts as well. And then it becomes an endless cycle of trying to make sure that you can prove your gratitude towards a person. But that was past me, lah. And like in recent years, I've realized that yeah, indeed, there needs to be like efforts to actually sustain or forge a deeper relationship, and that could really come from gift giving. Because otherwise, we don't really have much time to really, I guess, like bond with people. And gift giving at these kinds of symbolic occasions are a meaningful way to just you know connect. And I guess like what's good about secret centers, you can make wish lists, right? So it's not like you get like, shitty gifts that you don't want. Yeah, actually, on the topic of wish list, right, my philosophy behind gift giving is to present someone with something that they wouldn't usually buy. And I feel like making a wish list kind of defeats that whole, uh, the whole purpose of that. Is it? It's yeah. It's more like, you want to, like, hmm. <laughs> so I'm giving someone something that they always wanted, but haven't made the effort to get it for themselves for various reasons. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, that... That's also another um, valid interpretation of it. <laughs> and in the spirit of gift giving, uh, each of us has written a poem yeah. to commemorate Christmas. No, uh, mine's not commemorating Christmas, but oh. commemorating the end of the year. Oh, yes. And 
we will be posting these poems on our website and on our Instagram. So in case you want to uh, read it online or uh, out of this podcast, you can feel free to check them out there. So without further ado, Hao Yang will start with a reading of his poem. Drinking hot ginger tea with winter melon syrup and lotus seeds on a winter night in Hanoi. For Hangma. All seasons and tastes in a watery blur. A trickle of time in a patinated cup. Pale seeds of summer contain the neutral years, like pebbles in a lake with an old sheen of light. Looking at us, looking at them, Toadstools indulging in the slowness of being, while merchant boats drift leisurely by, and gander and geese honk urgently on. Swallow the moon by drinking the well, a month, a language, a roundness in the mouth, strange words as puffers in a place of no snow, or chattering seeds from flowering midnight suns. Sentiment is brewed over seasons, over days, a warm cup of tea is everything at the end. Thank you for that poem, Haoyang. And I will read um, my poem, which is titled The Kashimaya. Salu. The man in red pants and boots has chopped himself up. Scattered over the wood paneled floor, he told me to tell you to find him as a dog seeks out crumbs of fresh gingerbread. Then he hung his fur coat draped it over me and I smell bits of beard mixed with milk and cookies. You know they sing songs about him. One song tells us that he knows if you sleep with one eye closed or if you masturbate at night. It doesn't matter, it all doesn't matter. His rags remind me of Coca-Cola, liquid death nectar, drink drink and I'm happy. On the 24th we go to the shops, prices slashed like unwanted smut. But I want it. I want Santa to come down and kiss me, tell me to open my heart and my wallet, buy the same happiness for Barbie and Ken, buy soju so I black out drunk in an office white mall, while Jingle Bells plays on the speakers but it's distorted. It sounds like Krampus lecturing me on how I should live every day as if it's my last, because you never know if you choke on half a candy cane. At the end of the day, Krampus is just a man in a silicone mask who scares kids. Just as Russell Lee and Mr. Midnight do, judge their books by their covers, I didn't know gingerbread was spicy. I thought it would only taste like the sweet dirt they buried my favourite celebrities in. This Christmas, under the mistletoe, under the fireplace, under Santa's sleigh, under Rudolph's left nut, under the Christmas tree, a tired elf sat with a neat little bow on his silly head. So maybe how young do I like to give a brief introduction on what your poem is about or what you're trying to achieve with it? Okay, so I was in Hanoi recently on holiday and I did drink hot ginger tea with winter melon syrup and lotus seeds on a winter night in Hanoi. This is quite autobiographical. Um, but yeah, I think I was really moved by the way that uh, it felt like they were leading a different kind of lifestyle, the people there. So I think for me, the national pastime of the people living in Hanoi uh, seems to be, you know, just like people watching or traffic watching. So they would sit on these really low stools in cafes or along the road. And these stools, instead of like facing each other, they face the road, which I thought was really beautiful. And something else is that like they would really chew on sunflower seeds. Like you'd see sunflower seeds just littered on the floor. Ooh. And that's that kind of, you know, just living very slowly, just doing something repetitively and just it's like chewing time in a sense well wow, that's so poetic of me but yeah i was just really moved by that kind of different rhythm of life there um and how that seemed to me retrospectively to be condensed in that cup of tea i drank so i had this really beautiful vision for me of like the years of time the night all just being condensed into that cup of tea and how that cup of tea like contains all these different imaginations or like contains my memory of that place now. And also when I was writing this poem, like I had some Chinese words in my mind, like especially nong suo, which means like condense, right? But I feel like it's really hard to find a similarly poetic word in English. Like if I use condense, I can only think of, it's quite scientific for me. Um, but yeah, nong suo I think was the key word for me in writing this poem. It's really about different rhythms of life and 
about, I guess, using water as a metaphor for time. And I'll just keep it as, at that. Yeah, yeah that, that, <laughs> that is, um, that's really beautiful, actually. I, I think it's been a while since I've um, read like poetry that uh, tries to be beautiful. take itself slow and, and they are beautiful. <laughs> Um, yeah, for, for me, it was a combination of different things. So for one, I came out of reading, um, Mervyn Mirapuri's, uh, A Walk With My Pig, which was this like, uh, stream of consciousness sort of work. And it's already like chaotic and disordered. And I think that kind of reflects itself here. Mm. Uh, I was also trying to play with the, the idea of Santa Claus being this figure or this symbol of uh, capitalism rather than being like a deity uh, because I don't know if like this is actually true but uh, Coca-Cola actually invented the whole image of Santa Claus wearing like the, the red outfit mm -hmm. and everything so uh, I tried to play with that I tried to also toy with ideas of horror um so if uh, you caught it just now, Krampus is this like horned demon creature that is supposed to hunt down naughty children. And so there's this um, sort of paranoia that kind of runs throughout the poem. And lastly, I also wanted to um, explore the idea of foreignness. Um, because to me, Christmas is... I feel that Christmas is supposed to be familiar. It's supposed to be a an event where you just blend in seamlessly, right? Where you can just sink into it and feel like, oh, I belong, I belong here. Um, but for me, it just doesn't really, I don't really feel at ease. Um, I don't really feel like it's very familiar to me. So I, I have all these like um, images of foreigners, right? Um, the title Takashimaya, the the greeting or salu, um, soju and all that, and yeah, I think what I was basically trying to achieve with this with was some. Um, in a nutshell, is this like messy stream of consciousness, um, sort of work. Yeah, the ambivalence for me. You talk about like alienation, right? And I think I got that kind of dark undertone of being like estranged from something for example when you described coca-cola as liquid death nectar um and then also the kind of social critique you're talking about in relation to a walk with my pig also comes out with like your discussion of like consumerism in this poem for example and also about like there are many i think like references to surfaces the superficial to the simulacrum for example like barbie and ken and then Campus in the silicon mask. I just really like plus. I, I just really like the Barbie movie. Oh, but yeah, go on. Um, <laughs> which is also similarly chrome and and judging books by covers, right? So, yeah, I got that. But I think for me, I had a question also, which is, um, what does the you represent um, for you in this poem? Like, why do you choose to use that perspective? I I treated it as an internal dialogue, so the process of writing was. A, or an opportunity for me to come to terms with all these feelings that were bubbling up inside me and to put it on the page and I was trying to I sort of address myself, I guess. And I also wanted to input this element of intimacy to it, despite it uh, discussing alienation as well. And I, I felt that the, the juxtaposition there was, uh, would be a nice touch. And for, for you, right, I have a question as well. Um, is there a specific reason why it's uh, hot ginger tea with like winter melon syrup and lotus seeds? Because it's like a super like specific mm -hmm. um, set of words and, and food items. Oh, uh, actually, yeah, it's a good question. I think very intuitively, I started writing this poem from a very autobiographical perspective already. I guess it's because it's very site specific, the poem. Like, it really wants to situate you in this really particular place um, where you are thinking about the, the flavors of that place, um, the, different, the different people that populate these, this place, or in this poem, as metaphorized as like the toadstools, the boats, and the geese. 
Um, so yeah, it's, it really came from the the desire to make this really site specific because I think I'm someone who really, um, who really connects very deeply with places because I think places are, they store memory, they have a spirit to them, right? And I think that's what I really want to capture. So I was really inspired as well by um, uh, this Czech poet Yaroslav Seifert, who wrote a series of sonnets about his hometown, cap the capital city of the Czech Republic, Prague. And it's just this crown of sonnets, so 15 sonnets in total about the city. And I think that's something for me, that's something that I've wanted to strive for in a long time. So that's where I'm coming from. Um, but also I think something else other than like being site specific and really localized is that um, retrospectively thinking about this combination, right, which is something I actually had on that day, is that it really combines everything. It's like a melange of flavors, right? Like hot ginger tea, you already have like elements of warmth and spiciness. And even ginger, if you're being even more poetic, you can talk about how in Chinese, there's this thing like jiang hai shi lao de la, which is like the old ginger is spicier, right? So there's the element of time as well, letting things just simmer. And then for winter melon syrup, there's the kind of sweetness to it. Um, and lotus seeds is something more solid. Um, and also lotus seeds are like harvested in late summer, early autumn. So it's also thinking about like different seasons all coming into this one cup of tea as well, which is had on a winter night. And winter and night are both symbols of the end of something, you know, so... It's, I just found it really beautiful how, you know, you had all these different things across the year just being condensed into this one cup at the end of the year for me. Mm. Yeah. Right, and, and a bit of a digression here, but is this like your first time experiencing winter? I mean, there was no snow, so I'm not sure if it's considered real winter. Oh, there was, there was no snow? No, no, no. I, and oh, I think that's why, that's why I wrote then. What, which one, two, three, four, the fourth last line, like strange words as puffers in a place of no snow. So it's really just like a collective imagination thing. You know? oh. um, but also like, of, yeah, like it's winter because it gets much colder there compared to the rest of the year and compared to the mm -hmm. rest of the country. So, yeah. But so also like in like certain parts of Vietnam, like if you go higher up um, in the mountainous regions, right, it could snow, uh, so... In that region, it is considered winter law. Oh. Yeah. But the people but the people there treat it as winter, and I guess that's what really matters. Yeah. Right, and, and that is a really evocative um, image, actually. So this idea of warmth, right, within the coldness of the winter. Yeah, it's something I really want to capture really badly, like about how that, having that warm cup of, because I was thinking as well, you know, about how throughout human history, like, this is something that has never changed. The way a warm cup of tea can bring you such comfort in a cold environment. So I was really drawn to that as well. Mm. So that's why I wrote, like, a warm cup of tea is everything at the end. Like, it can really be everything. Uh, if you're a simple person. Uh. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, it, it really can be everything. Yeah. I love tea. And, yeah, for all of you listening out there, I hope you enjoyed both of our poems. Um, thank you for listening. And... Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Bye-bye.